am so excited to be sharing today in week two of our teaching series called Infinitely More. And uh, my husband, Brandon, is normally here on the front row. He is under the weather today, like so many people that I know, so be in prayer for him. But he is prayerfully praying us through from his bed right now. Um, but we're in Infinitely More week two, and we are going through a series where we're talking really about getting more of God, experiencing more of who he is. And last week, Pastor Brandon talked all about creating more space, more margin to experience more of God. We looked at the postures of Mary and Martha and how Mary chose what is better by choosing to sit at the feet of Jesus rather than keep herself distracted and occupied with all of the tasks that were in front of her. And we're really basing this whole series off of Ephesians 3.20, which says, all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. And today in week two of this series, I wanna talk about finding more joy in 2024. And if you're taking notes today, the title of this message is Defiant Joy. So I want to start with a question. How are you? Good. I'm so glad, Miss Janice. How are you? How are you really? You can give me the churchy answer of like, I'm good, or the DC answer of I'm busy. But how are you really? You know, as followers of Jesus, one of the things that is scripturally encouraged to us to mark and define our lives is a, a posture and a spirit of joy. And I'm gonna kick things off with a little vulnerability in the room today and let you know that this is hard for me because I am a person who my natural disposition is kind of a glass half empty kind of girl. And this is something that as I'm preaching this message, full disclosure and vulnerability, I'm preaching this to myself just as much as to every single one of us in the room here today. I think we all need a little more joy. This ought to mark, this ought to define, this ought to characterize our disposition as people of God in the world. Now, if I was to define biblical joy for you here in the room, this is a kind of simple definition based on my, my study of scripture this week. Biblical joy is choosing to respond to external circumstances with inner contentment and peace because we know that God will use all experiences to accomplish his purpose in and through our lives. And this is why this message is called Defiant Joy. Because regardless of circumstance, regardless of how you feel, regardless of what's happening externally, our joy needs to be a little defiant in the face of it. Why? Because what Sydney talked about, we serve a God who has already accomplished the victory. And so that is the, the place from which our joy springs. And so today, what I, what I want to do in the room, as I'm, I've already shared with you that my natural disposition is a bit more on the pessimistic side, I approach joy with maybe a little bit more of a skeptic's eye. And so what I want to do today is I want to maybe deconstruct some of those common arguments against or mindsets against having a spirit of joy so that we can reconstruct a durable theology of joy to guide and direct direct our lives. And so I want to start today by talking about some things that the joy of the Lord is not. And the first is this, the joy of the Lord is not naive. Have you thought this before? When you think, look at someone who has all this joy and it's just like such a defining part of their life and you think, well, you're just naive. You haven't really experienced enough hardship or struggle or pain. What does naive mean? It means showing a lack of experience or wisdom or judgment. And maybe you think, well, you just have joy because you're simple-minded or you're unsophisticated or you haven't experienced enough. Like, you just don't know what real suffering is. It's kind of like when um, me and Brandon, we had Finley, who's our firstborn daughter, and she was just an easy kid, guys. I mean, she slept through the night pretty early on. She would sleep till 9.30, 10 a.m. She potty trained in one day, and she's just generally a really good kid, and me and Brandon would look at each other and be like, we are incredible parents. <laughs> we need to write a book. I think God has this anointing on us, like... How are we so gifted at our first go at this? And then we had Carson. And if you know him, 
you know what I'm talking about. And I'm just going to speak into the camera. And I, Carson, if you watch this later in life, I love you. You're amazing. I believe in you. You were also a very difficult baby. And we came to realize <laughs> that we were not the incredible parents that we thought we were. We were actually just naive. We didn't really know what parenting was really like because we hadn't encountered opposition or struggle yet. But I want to encourage you with this today. It is not naive to possess the joy of the Lord. I mean, I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And then he says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. What is Paul saying here? He's saying not everything is perfect. I am not naive. We are hard pressed. We are struck down. There is difficulty and opposition, but one thing we know is that in Christ, we are never destroyed. In Christ, we are never defeated because we understand that in Christ, we have the victory. He's saying not everything is fun, not everything is easy. In Christ, I can never be defeated. Therefore, I do not despair. I am never alone. I love what Paul's saying here. He's basically saying, I know, but I'm still good. The joy of the Lord is not naive. The second thing the joy of the Lord is not is the joy of the Lord is not an act. There's some buzzwords that you might hear maybe on social media or just in popular culture at large. Buzzwords like toxic positivity or performative joy. And um, I actually want to sidestep for one moment before I continue on with this. I just want to encourage you pastorally today to be really discerning with your consumption and your distribution of social media. I think as the church, we need to be a little more discerning into what we allow to lead us and guide us and instruct us. I think we need to adopt the posture of the Bereans, who even when Paul was preaching to them, they listened to everything that he said, but they tested it against scripture because they understood that that was the only unfailing source of wisdom. And I think I see so many Christians being deceived by little sound bites that sound really good, that have like what Timothy, what Paul writes to Timothy, like a form of godliness, but denying its power. And we get seduced by this thing because it rhymes and it sounds good based on what culture is saying, but it doesn't find its roots in scripture. I think we need to test the spirits like it says in 1 John. We need to understand that there are others who are, who are, who are tickling our ears like it says in 1 Timothy. And we need to be discerning with our consumption of social media. But that's an aside and that's a message I'm going to have to preach another time. But there's these buzzwords, toxic positivity, performative joy. It's this idea that you are trying so hard to pretend to be happy that it's not authentic so it's actually unhelpful. It's kind of like you've all seen this cartoon like of this dog in the fire where it's like, no, this is fine. I'm good. I'm so happy right now. My life is falling apart. Everything is good. Performative meaning that your joy is not authentic, that it's based on an illusion. But the joy of the Lord is not a performance. It's not like you act happy in public, but behind the scenes you're miserable. Why? Because the Bible and Jesus never asked you to act. You know, there's something in the Bible called lament. And this is a biblical concept of being honest before God about your pain, your anxiety, and even your frustration towards God, which proves to us that no one is expecting you to be forcibly happy at all times because sometimes life is hard. Sometimes life sucks. Let's just be honest in church today. We are given space in scripture to lament. But here's the distinction that we have to understand. With biblical lament, lament is never the end in itself. And this is what I see happen with a lot of people and even a lot of Christians is that they just lament and they leave it there. But biblical lament overwhelmingly finds its conclusion in hope and in praise. Laments make up half of the Psalms. And I did a study of all of the laments in the Psalms this week. And of half of the Psalms, only two of the laments end without resolution. Every other lament in scripture concludes with a reminder of 
the, the writer to say, hey, all of this is happening, but I will still trust you. All of this is happening, but I believe that my God is still in control. And this is how biblical lament is to conclude. An author wrote that lament is a divinely given liturgy for processing our pain so that we can rejoice. Lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. It is not only how Christians grieve, it's the way Christians praise God through their sorrows. Lament is a pathway to praise when life gets hard. N.T. Wright says, lament is an appeal to God based on confidence in his character. There are four different elements of a lament scripturally. It's turning to God in prayer. It's bringing our complaints about our situation and even sometimes about God himself. It's asking boldly and then the conclusion is always choosing to trust and to praise. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Lamentations 3 the thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet, I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends and his mercies never cease. The writer here is not performing. He's not pretending. There's no Christian mask being worn here. He is sad. He is anguished. But the distinguishing characteristic of followers of Jesus is that we can hurt with hope. And that is the joy of the Lord. I'm going to give you one more example from my favorite psalm, Psalm 77. It says, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? I love verse 10. But then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years that the Most High stretched out his right hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and I will meditate on your mighty deeds. Read Psalm 57. I, I wish I could read all of these, but we won't have enough time. Psalm 57, read it this week. It feels like it's written by two different people. Like on one hand, the, the author is grieving and on the other hand, he's like, I love you, Lord, I praise you, God. Read Psalm 43. The final stanza of Psalm 43, I believe, if you're struggling with joy, is a really helpful verse to hide in your heart, to remind yourself, yet I will put my faith in you. I will put my hope in your unfailing love. And I want you to hear this today, church. No one is asking you to pretend that everything is perfect or that everything is painless. That would be disingenuous and unhelpful. But what is required of those of us who claim the name of Jesus is to embody joy in the midst of suffering and to choose hope and praise regardless of our circumstances. Which leads me to my third thing, that joy is not. The joy of the Lord is also not the absence of suffering. And I think we believe well, when life is good and easy and simple, then I have joy. But when it's not, then I do not. Or maybe you think, well, no wonder they have joy. Their life is perfect. Mine, not so much. I believe that the modern Western church has become anesthetized. And we don't have a very high pain tolerance. We're, we're kind of spiritual wimps. The modern Western church, we get one hint of suffering or pain or discomfort, and we either blame God, we start to believe that this whole faith thing isn't working, or maybe we even tap out altogether. We say things like, I can't do this. This is too hard. I didn't sign up for this. Why is this so hard? And what I'm not trying to do, church, right now is I'm not trying to gaslight you or minimize your pain or your suffering, but what I do want to do is pastorally encourage you today that saying yes to our faith was never about having an easy or painless or perfect road. We are very clearly promised in scripture that there will be opposition, there will be trials, and we will need to daily carry our cross and deny ourselves. You know, I think to give us a little bit of encouragement and it'll maybe give us a little bit of conviction, I want to look at some examples from the early church of how they bore through suffering and opposition and pain with hope and with joy. 
Romans, the Romans wondered at the courage of the Christians in the Colosseum, many of whom faced their martyrdom with singing. In the martyrdom of saints Perpetua and Felicity, it speaks about Perpetua and Felicity being brought to the arena to face the wild beasts. And it says, the day of their victory dawned, and they marched from the prison to the amphitheater joyfully, as though they were going to heaven with calm faces, trembling, if at all, with joy rather than fear. Perpetua went along with shining countenance and calm step as the beloved of God, putting down everyone's stare by her own intense gaze. And meanwhile, we want to tap out when we've had an overwhelming week and have a fight with a coworker. Eusebius wrote about the joy of the Christians at their own death, saying they despised terrors, going readily with joy to death. St. John Christostom explained Paul's joy this way. For the love of Christ, Paul bore every burden. The most important thing of all to him was that he knew himself to be loved by Christ. And enjoying this love, he considered himself happier than anyone else. And you know what this shows us, church? It shows us that joy is not the absence of suffering. Joy is the presence of God. And in the midst of your suffering, you can still have great joy because you have Jesus. He is with you. We know that nothing can separate us from his love. In Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Skip down a verse. It says, no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, let this build a little faith in your spirit today, church, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Biblical joy is not the absence of suffering. It's an awareness of the presence of your Savior. Timothy Keller says, there is joy available that the deepest grief cannot put out. No circumstance or person can take away the joy that God gives. And Charles Spurgeon says, your sorrow itself will be turned into joy. Not that the sorrow will be taken away and joy to be put in its place, but that the very sorrow which now grieves you will be turned into joy. God not only takes away the bitterness and gives sweetness in its place, but he turns the bitterness into sweetness itself. Like we know from Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Joy is not the absence of suffering. The joy of the Lord is also not out of touch or insensitive. You know, I think sometimes out of very noble and commendable intention, we think that because of things happening around the world or in the lives of people in our world, that these circumstances should determine the state of our joy. And if we don't allow that to be the case, then we will come across as insensitive to the pain around us or out of touch. Like maybe we just need to carry ourselves in a posture that's kind of sad out of solidarity. And what I am not saying is that we should not choose empathy because it is clear in scripture that God's people should be marked by compassion and empathy for those who are suffering. But what I am saying is that our joy can be a contagious and desperately needed life-giving source of hope to those that are suffering around us. You know, there's a leadership principle from Edwin Friedman that's called differentiation. And I've preached on this before. You've heard it. Uh, it's this idea of being a non-anxious presence. And it's essentially the ability to bring a non-anxious response in the midst of an anxious system. And it is the mark and the definition of a good leader. So Friedman writes that a differentiated or non-anxious leader is able to organize the group around strengths as opposed to weaknesses, to respond to problems in an objective manner instead of reacting emotionally, and to take a stand in the face of intense pressure in an emotional system. What does it mean to be differentiated? It means that when everyone else is panicking, a differentiated leader is able to stay calm and lead well. It means that when everyone else is stressed, a differentiated leader is able to find solutions. 
It means that when everyone else believes the worst, a differentiated leader believes the best. And does it mean that these leaders are out of touch or insensitive to what is happening in the anxious system of which they are a part? No. It just means that they are not allowing the anxiety around them to determine and dictate the way that they carry themselves in the midst of it. I believe that the world needs more differentiated Christians. What the world does not need is a bunch of Eeyore Christians who respond to the pain and hardship of the world by becoming defeated and despondent themselves. What the world does need is differentiated, non-anxious Christians who respond to the pain and the hardship of the world with the hope and the joy and the love that comes from Christ alone. Like we read in Hebrews 6.19, we have this hope as an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. Henry Nouwen writes, joy is essential to the spiritual life. Whatever we may think or say about God, when we are not joyful, our thoughts and our words cannot bear fruit. Jesus reveals to us God's love so that his joy may become ours and that our joy may be complete. Catch this. Joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, even death, can take that love away. The fifth thing that we see today is that the joy of the Lord is not contingent on our circumstances. In other words, it's not an emotion. Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness is based on happenings. Happiness comes from without, and joy comes from within. Henry Nouwen also writes, joy is not the same as happiness. We can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because it comes from the knowledge of God's love for us. And I think a lot of us think of joy as a feeling, but it's actually reductive to think of joy as merely a feeling because joy transcends the feelings that you have in any moment. Joy is not the fruit of an emotion. Joy is the root of our lives. S.D. Gordon says that joy is a distinctly Christian word and a Christian thing. It is the reverse of happiness because happiness is the result of what happens of an agreeable sort. Joy has its springs down deep inside and the spring never runs dry no matter what happens. Only Jesus gives that joy. He had joy singing its music within even under the shadow of the cross. What does Hebrews 12 tell, tell us? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I think one of the best examples of joy not being based on circumstances is really the entire book of Philippians. And if you read Philippians without context, you'll walk away thinking, man, that was so encouraging. That was so life-giving, so positive, so uplifting. And then you consider the circumstances within which Philippians was written as Paul, the apostle who authored the book, sat in a prison cell rotting away Prison cells today don't have good conditions. Can you imagine thousands of years ago the conditions that he was sitting in with no hope of release, actually more of a promise of execution on the other side, and he had the audacity to sit in this prison cell and write one of the most encouraging and life-giving books in the entire Bible. I mean, the whole book, the theme of it is joy. It's rejoicing. In, verse, in chapter 1, verse 4, he prays with joy. In chapter 1, verse 18, he rejoices that Christ is proclaimed. In 1, 25, he speaks about the Philippians' joy in the faith. In 2, verse 2, he asks the Philippians to complete his joy. In 2, 17, he's glad and he rejoices. In 2, 28, he sends Epaphroditus so the Philippians may rejoice. In 2, 29, he tells the Philippians to receive Epaphroditus with joy. And on and on and on. Throughout this book, in every chapter, in every verse, there is this optimism. There is this hope. There is this spirit of joy that can only define someone who understands that a prison cell and even a death sentence cannot rob me of the hope that I have in Jesus. And that should define and mark our lives. Despite his circumstances, Paul possessed a defiant joy. The joy of the Lord is not subject to your circumstances. We sang that song at the beginning of service. It's like, I've got Jesus, so I've got joy. <clears throat> Do we believe that? I think some of us would sing like, I've got financial security, so I've got joy. I'm not going to, it's my audition for Union City Worship. Or I've got a boyfriend, 
so I've got joy. Or my team made the playoffs. <laughs> no, it's I've got Jesus, so I've got joy. And nothing can add or subtract to that joy because I've got Jesus. I've got all that I need. Mother Teresa says that a joyful heart is the inevitable result of a heart burning with love. And she says, never let anything so fill you with sorrow as to make you forget the joy of Christ risen. So we've talked about what the joy of the Lord is not. And I want to end very briefly by talking about what the joy of the Lord is. The first, the joy of the Lord is a choice. James 1 Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it pure joy. Consideration is a choice. What are you thinking about? What are you meditating on. It's a exhortation to choose what you see. You know, we've all seen these optical illusions online. I've got a few of them. Um, we can throw the first one up. Let me see. Okay, so this optical illusion, maybe you've seen it before. Um, I don't know if you see the young woman looking over her shoulder to the right or the older woman kind of like in a fur jacket. Raise your hand if you see the young woman. I want to see who I'm working with here today. Okay, raise your hand if you see the older woman. Okay, wow, so we are um, divided. There's another one. Let's put the other one up. We've got, okay, do you see a rabbit or do you see a duck? Who sees a rabbit? You guys are divergent. <laughs> okay, the next one. Oh, old faithful. <laughs> is it a white dress or is it a blue dress? <laughs> Does anyone see a white dress? Oh my gosh, like half the room. I'm actually shocked. <laughs> With these optical illusions, it all depends, you see, it all depends on what you are considering, what you are looking for. What is the lens through which you view your circumstances? What are you considering? When it comes to the hardships in your life, you can consider it a curse. You can consider it unfair. Or you can consider it pure joy. Knowing that God is infinitely redemptive in his purposes. He wastes nothing. And he is always in the business of bringing beauty from ashes. Henry Nouwen says, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It is a choice based on the knowledge that we belong to God and have found God, our refuge, and our safety, and that nothing, not even death, can take away God from us. So the joy of the Lord is a choice. The second, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah. Chapter 8, it says, go and enjoy cho choice foods and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, it does not say that your possessions are your strength. Your position at work is your strength. Your paycheck that's paying that rent is your strength. No, our strength is in something unshakable. The Lord is our strength. And the joy of the Lord gives us strength to face whatever comes every day of our lives. The third thing that the joy of the Lord is, is it's a command. First Thessalonians 5, it says, always be joyful. Philippians 4, Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say it, rejoice. It's a command, it's written in the imperative and it's interesting because it's the only command in the Bible that's written this way. You don't see, do not murder. And again, I say, do not murder. <laughs> Why do you think Paul felt the need to re-emphasize this fact? I think it's because he knew that a lot of us wouldn't take this command to rejoice very seriously. We take other commands in the Bible seriously. Okay, like I will not murder anyone. 
but will you rejoice always? It's a command. We are both, we are both commanded to rejoice and we should be characterized by rejoicing. The fourth and final thing that the joy of the Lord is, it's our greatest witness. We're fasting as a church, like you heard during announcements. And again, we're, we have a spirit of vulnerability in this house. Fasting is my least favorite spiritual discipline, period. Like I just, ugh. And it's hard, but no one talks about how hard it is when you have kids and you're fasting because they still got to eat breakfast. And guess who cooks it? Mom. And I still got to pack the lunches and I still got to make Finley's daily post-school quesadilla. That's like her favorite. She looks forward to her quesadilla after school every day. You know, yesterday I had to drive through McDonald's at lunchtime to get my kids some lunch. And have you ever been fasting and been in the same room as McDonald's french fries? <sighs> It's hard, guys. I just could smell the grease and they were salty. And she said, man, these are so good. Do you want some? And I said, I do. But I want God more. And I'm looking at my kids' food and I'm like, oh, I would give anything to have that. And that is what our joy should be for people. That they look at the joy that marks our lives and say, I would give anything to have that. That is what our joy can and should be to other people. Because do you understand that we live in a world that is hungry for hope, that is hungry for peace, that is hungry for joy. And we possess the joy of the Lord. So when people look at the quality of your life, do they say, I would give anything to have that? Or do they look at your life and think, why would I want that? They're just as hopeless and despondent as I am. Our joy can be our greatest witness. The way that we choose to have joy in the midst of life's circumstances, the way that we encourage and build faith in others, the way that we firmly believe that the best is yet to come because we know that no matter what happens, we have the hope of eternity. And that does not mean that we are naive, that we are without suffering, that we are faking it, that we're out of touch or insensitive, or even that we are in comfortable circumstances. It just means that we have a higher perspective, a hope that is tethered to something greater than this world and a peace that transcends understanding. In closing, I wanna leave you with a formula for joy. I'm gonna boil it down, make it simple, and hopefully this will stick with you. How to have joy, it's three things. It's remembrance, confidence, and it's perseverance. It's remembrance. Remembering the faithfulness of God over the course of your life. And even the shut doors and the rocky paths, he never has failed you. He has never abandoned you. And then the second part is confidence. Looking back with gratitude for what God has done and having confidence that he will do it again. That he is faithful to complete it. And the third thing is just perseverance. That no matter what this season looks like for you, if it's hard, if it's beautiful, if it's confusing, we're just gonna keep going because we serve a faithful God who was faithful then and I have confidence that he will continue to be faithful in my future. And that is what we place our hope and our trust in. And so today, church, I'm really just had one aim and one agenda with this message, and it was just to encourage you. And encouragement means to give courage. So whether tomorrow morning you've got a lot on your plate that you've been just not looking forward to, or maybe you're walking through one of the darkest valley seasons you've ever walked through, you can hurt with hope because you have a God who is with you, who has never left you, will never forsake you, and who has your back always. Let's pray together, church. Lord, thank you for the promise and the gift of joy. And I just pray today that you give us all a fresh perspective as we leave this room, that you lift our spirits, that you help us to get our hopes up, that we can put our faith in a God who has never failed us, that regardless of circumstances, no matter what happens, you are in control and you can be trusted. So Lord, renew our joy today. Give us beauty for ashes. Give us faith for the future and give us confidence in your hand. 
We love you, Jesus. And it's in the name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Amen.